Hello, Shiatsu therapists all over the world. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Another week, another episode, but this time on Monday instead of Friday. Uh, and we honored our guest, uh, therefore we made on Monday, Clifford Andrews, all the way from the UK, is joining us this week. Hello, Cliff. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you very much for doing it on a Monday. Uh, it's <laughs> it's my honor. It's my pleasure. And uh, I really wanted to have you on because I know you're quite busy and uh, busy all the way to July, which which I won't be here. Uh, right. But it's great to have you no matter what day it is uh, and right. great for you to join us and to share with us uh, Shiatsu and innovation. That's the topic today. Okay, yeah, great. I just, uh, I've got some slides and everything that I can... Fantastic. Um... Oh, look, Elaine's coming on from the UK. How about that? Yes. Amazing. Okay, look, I know I know a lot of people already. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I've got some slides and we've got an hour together. Um, and we're going to leave like 15 minutes for questions at the end. That's I right. Understand. So that's right. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just share my screen. Okay. So I guess the theme, the theme for the next hour is like contrasting and comparing shiatsu knowledge that we learn when we actually learn shiatsu, the traditional knowledge that goes back and what's happening um, with scientific knowledge as well. Um, and I thought I'd start off, um, well, first of all, by saying thank you to uh, Mihail for inviting me. It's always, nice to be on, it's always nice to be on someone else's show. I do so many webinars myself, so it's so great to be on the other side of it and not have to organize everything. So I That's really appreciate right. that. <laughs> um, yeah, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about my background and why I'm interested in this topic and some of the things that I've got up to over the last 40 years that I've been doing shiatsu. Um, and then I thought we could just have a little bit of a look into why science has, has been so slow um, to really allow us to understand shiatsu, um, but things are changing really fast. And that's the really the exciting thing. I'm really excited about what's happening now. And I've got some really interesting contacts with people who are right on the forefront of how we're discovering things. And it's really kind of a two way thing. Shiatsu can really help um, guide us in our knowledge of life and how it works and also science can also show us things that maybe we didn't really know about with shiatsu that can help us explain some of the amazing experiences that we have as clients and as um as givers and receivers of shiatsu so that's the kind of theme um so i thought i just for now just say a little bit about my background so what happened to me was i basically i was a science student at school i did sciences um I was interested in what science could tell us about the world. But then what happened was, for various reasons um, that happened to me, I actually became kind of addicted to yoga when I was quite young, just self-taught. So I was doing a lot of yoga and a lot of meditation really quite young, um, basically because of tra childhood traumas that I'd had. So mm. I didn't realize it at the time, but that's what I was doing. I was kind of like healing myself yes. um, through yoga. And so what happened was um, the experiences I was having in yoga and meditation didn't really fit with the story that I was being told at school about how the world worked and how the body worked and things like yes. that. And it just didn't make sense to me. And I, and that started me off on a kind of train of just kind of journey. And then I went to university and I studied environmental sciences in a very good open university, like a university that had a lot of options. Yes. And I took a philosophy of science module then that gave me a lot more information about the structure of scientific knowledge its limitations and its advantages and I kind of followed that through then through that I then went more into the shiatsu side of it and I got into shiatsu as soon as I as soon as I left university and I've been doing it for 40 years amazing now 41 years amazing <laughs> actually, 42 this year um and um I've been fortunate to actually work with some very interesting scientists along the way and and that's I think the most exciting thing at the moment for me is that things that were kind of kind of like nuts 40 years ago, like really crazy woohoo and white out there things. And now we can really can understand them. Um, and science is slowly, slowly, slowly catching up with the worldview and the kind of way that we experience things in chats. And I think that's that's an amazing thing to, that I've seen in my lifetime. Really, really excited about that. Um, so what I've got is I've got a few slides sort of opening up that story a bit. 
And then I've got three exercises that are related to some of the research um, that can tell us more about um, what's actually going on uh, phys in physical terms sort of thing when we do stuff in Shiatsu. And there's several reasons why I think that's a good idea. And one of them is I think it's really good to have a range of language that we can use when we explain what we're doing. And I've actually got an exercise specifically for that, contrasting the whole idea of yin and yang with sort of a Western idea of what's going on when we do an exercise. And I think it's really good to have a, a broader vocabulary because when we're talking to clients, some of them may not really be respond to yin and yang and Taoist thought and things like that. You know, they may not, they, that may not connect with them, but if we can say, oh, you know, it's your parasympathetic nervous system being stimulated by this, or this is, a, you know, connective tissue is piezoelectric, you know, suddenly they'll switch on and they go, oh, right, okay, and they'll get right in there. That's one reason I think it's really important. And the second thing is general, because the Western scientific model is the dominant world model, whether we like it or not, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, when we're doing things and just like one example of a really exciting project that we set up in Norwich um, as part of the Shiatsu scene there is we've got this uh, mental health um, first aid support group thing going on with the local council so we funded that through a Shiatsu, what we call the Shiatsu Angels which is like a donating sort of fund that people donate to that we've created during the pandemic um, and basically we set up this mental health project and what I did was I put together a protocol which is basically shiatsu but yeah. I broke it down so that shiatsu is a little bit at the bottom and all the rest of it is all in western language like focusing you know nervous system breathing blah 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 blah. Um, um, so basically it, it makes it much more sellable you know you can spell it and say look hey look this is a, and also I got Cindy as well we talked about Cindy Engel I got yeah. her to do some research for us to give us um, the the kind of references that underpin the techniques, you know what I mean? Got and uh, and so it's really useful to be able to do that, to have the access to that. So I'd like to just share a little bit of that with you in the next hour. I um, agree. That's okay. Yeah, does that sound good? Okay, so let's go back to the slides. Um, okay, so that's my kind of background, what, what I've done. And so now I'd just like to just discuss or just explore out why science has been so slow to understand shiatsu what's going on in shiatsu some of the reasons and some of them are very deep reasons they're deep um sort of philosophical reasons and worldview reasons um and some of them more practical <laughs> like money and power and stuff um and then also what i'd like to do also share with you as we go through then into the sort of second part is just do some exercises together and then we'll explore how we can explain what's happening in those exercises by research that's been done and scientific understanding. So that's the kind of thing. That's great. Okay, so as I mentioned in my introduction, I mean, when I started Shiatsu in 1981, I would say that pretty much science knew pretty much very little, almost nothing about how Shiatsu worked. And now, well, actually it's more than 40 years now, um, but certainly in the last 10 or 20 years, I think we can pretty much explain pretty much everything we do um, in terms of uh, different scientific branches. Um, here's a bit of background. Here's an interesting thing that happened to me. I went to the uh, Science Museum uh, quite a few years ago now. I went to the Science Museum in London and in the top floor, they've got a massive section on world medicine that's funded by the Wellcome Institute. And it was just fascinating to go around that whole thing because it literally had all the content medicine from all the continents all the way around you know like asia the americas all the traditional medicine and then it had western medicine as well scientific medicine in the sort of corner bit yeah um and something really struck me going through the entire history of medicine over like the last five thousand years that, sci that scientific medicine is an complete outlier it's really really unusual because in terms of world medicine the oh it's the only medical system that doesn't integrate the physical the spiritual level particularly into the physical healing system you know despite the fact by the way and which is something i discovered recently is that actually if you have a spiritual faith your medical outcomes are measurably different so Scientific research shows that actually, if you do have a strong spiritual um, path, you're actually going to get better quicker. 
but it doesn't really have any uh, any way of fitting anything like that together in the system. And there is a reason for that, which we'll oh, find out um, in a moment. Yes. Yeah, because it's a structural thing to do with the nature of scientific inquiry. And it goes back um, to Descartes, really. He usually gets the blame, most of the yeah, blame, yes. as you probably have already heard. He's turning um, his grave as we speak. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so, I mean, apart from the actual power structures in medicine, which are obviously dominated by the pharmaceutical industry and obviously scientific research, a lot of it's funded through the pharmaceutical industry and they don't really want to find out that actually if you just get somebody pressing a point, it will do this or working on a body, it's going to do this because there's no real way of monetizing that. So that's going to definitely skew the research towards pharmaceuticals. But there's also a different reason as well, which is the fact that science itself structurally had difficulty exploring complex human experiences. And it's really the more, it's only really, I would say, the last 10, 20 years that a lot of the more cutting edge scientists have broken through that for one reason or another. Um, so go, so here's the guy who gets most of the rap for <laughs> the way science is structured. He, he's, he is the one who's usually blamed for the mind-body split. Um, and what that what he did is basically he laid that that mind body split laid the foundations of reductive what's called reductive materialism. There we are. That's a bit of philosophy for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So reduct reductive um, materialism basically splits the mind and the body, and it observes the body as if it's an object outside of ourselves. And that's got some advantages because we can figure out how it all works like a machine. But of course, it's got some massive disadvantages as well, because the whole spiritual side and some, to some extent, the psychological and they're just a conscious, especially consciousness is a really difficult thing to explain when you're looking at the body like that. Um, so basically, um, as I just more or less said, the, the, um, the body and the mind are considered to be made of matter. And so they, they're like a machine and Basically, that's the materialist bit. It's a material thing you're looking at. And the whole approach is to break it down and try and understand the smaller and smaller basic components. And that's why it's called reductive. So you're always breaking everything down. Okay. And that's, I'm sure everyone who does shiatsu must have had this experience where they've had a client come in and say, um, oh, I've got this knee problem. And I've noticed that every time I get angry, my knee gets worse. And I went to the hospital. And I, they said that's that's impossible, you know. Or they said, you know, I've, I've noticed that when I get this pain in the top of my shoulders, my knee aches or something like that. And it's when I get angry, you know. And I went to the hospital. And they said, no, 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 you know, you have to go to the shoulder department for that, and then you need to go and see the psychologist for the anger. And you know what I mean? They just they have. Yeah. There's absolutely no way they can do that. They, and it's not their fault. It's just because they're in this reductive materialist system. Yes. Um, the interesting thing is that actually that whole thing got blown apart in the twenties anyway because of the quantum revolution. Um, but the thing is, it, that common sense idea that the body is a machine um, and it's outside of ourselves still kind of forms part of what the Western model is of kind of common sense. Okay, and this is uh, another thing about the 1920s is to get these, to reveal these dudes are like quantum physicists. And when they started to really get to grips with quantum theory, they realized that, um, that the that consciousness is part of the deep fabric of the universe. And that was mind blowing for them. But that quantum uh, experience of the fact that, that we actually kind of create, co-create the universe through interacting with it at a deep level, never really filtered through into sort of medical research until much more recently for various different reasons. Um, so that's what happens. If you get reductive materialism, you're going to have a system that breaks everything down. And there is obviously a power to that. I mean, Western medicine is very powerful at operations, at figuring out down to the last detail what little cell does this, what virus does that. And it has a lot of power, but it's like yin and yang. The more you go one way, the more you're going to be deficient on the other side. And that's what's happened. And that's why Chiatsu and Qigong and yoga and everything are so massively popular now because. They're a way of balancing that out. The whole holistic thing is a way of balancing out that mechanistic view. Okay, so look, here's an example of what happens, and this is what's happened in the Western in Western society. We've got four different levels. We've got the physical body, the emotional body, 
the mind level and the spiritual level and each of those is a specialization hasn't it that yes the priest is, looks after your spirit the psychiatrist looks after the mind psychotherapist or the agony aren't when you write into the newspaper and say i'm having problems with my partner uh deals on the emotional side and then physical medicine deals with the body and that's tended to be what's happened tended to uh, that's tended uh, to be the way things have gone but is this a problem and actually in the, the original slides that i produced is i had about half a dozen people saying why it's a problem but and i've just selected two for you okay um and here are just two people who think it's a problem okay and this is uh stephen portis who's famous for his polyvagal yes, theory polyvagal theory yeah yeah exactly which is a great theory and he's another he's one who he's just one of the um one of the many scientists that are trying to cut through that because he because he, he's making connections um, with uh, the mind and the body connections through the vagal system and all the rest of it. And look what he wrote, the mind-body split has prevented collaborative research in psychotherapy and neurophysiology, you know? So a split up, like exactly like my previous slide, this slide here, a split up. And so it's a problem because you're not gonna get collaborative research. Um, and then Pat Ogden, another great um, yeah. researcher and scientist, and look, the mind-body split has held back psychotherapy from developing a somatic approach. You see, again, psychotherapy and som somatic approach to psychotherapy are now really starting to take off, but it's been yeah. slow because of that mind-body split. It's a huge, it's a huge war these days. Uh, Peter Levine too. Yeah, exactly, Peter Levine. And in fact, actually, one of the ones I didn't keep in these slides, which is actually um, one of my favorites, is from James Oshman because he's um he's very critical and in fact a lot of people that i know a lot of scientists that i know who try and work in this field are critical because they their work is often suppressed because it doesn't fit the uh current paradigm yes and so it, and sometimes people have actually lost their job for suggesting things like the body has got electrical current running through it it can be quite a serious thing actually um but things are changing though so that's great okay but look at what we've got though okay <laughs> Exactly. We've got just, I mean, even just the whole concept of key is interesting because key, the, the word itself, you notice that we can't translate that into Western language, okay? And there's a reason for that because the word key cuts across the mind-body split because what it does is it comes from a pre-scientific holistic philosophy of Taoism, which has a concept of the existence, existence being a, le a, a range of different um, vibrations or whatever you want to call it, different levels, you know what I mean, that are all integrated in one. And that's where you get the steam and the rice thing, the, yes. the radicals for key, you get the steam and the rice, which is the steam represents the spirit and the mind and the, the rice is the physical, physical, but they're both intertwined, just like rice cooking. So that's why what that, that's why we sometimes have had a problem bridging that gap because if we are in the the um Taoist paradigm and we know understand the word of key, word he at a deep level we've got a, a whole linguistic tool there of philosophically cutting through the mind body split and experiencing that and that's what happened to me when i was a kid when i was experimenting with yoga and meditation i was like getting into that zone and that's what happens to all shiatsu therapists as they train. They, they're, they're physically connect, they are physically and energetically connected to those levels through the work of key, you see? Mm. Yeah. But things are changing, okay? And because of a lot of radical, I think a lot of radical scientists or just scientists in general finding out more about life. And also they're more sophisticated because they're aware of um they're aware that the mind body split has held back research in certain areas. So things are changing and there's lots of really exciting stuff coming up, as I mentioned earlier. And I just got, I've got tons. I mean, I could be here all yeah. night. <laughs> of course, of course. But so I just got the greatest hits for you today because we've only Thank got an you. hour. So I thought I'd just select out the greatest hits. Um, and here's some of those stuff that I really like. Okay. Um, and I've got exercises as well to, 
to get us to Absolutely. feel this as well. Yeah. Um, I've got three exercises coming up that I'd like you to take part in. Um, so the first thing, which I'm really excited about, this comes out from James Osman's work. I mean, it's not his research. He's just compiled a lot of it. And I'll give you some references later on. Um, and that's to do with the biomagnetic field in the hands. The fact that um, collagen fibers and fascia is piezoelectric. I'll explain what that means later in a minute, if you don't know what that is already. And also the principle of induction in connective tissues are really exciting. It explains a lot of what we can feel and what's happening when we do body work. Another really exciting bit of research recently that comes from the mindfulness movement is how meditative practice um, actually changes, change can change us as well. And also breathing in the nervous system, got an exercise for that as well. And then I thought we'd have a quick look at some of the explanations of why the meridians or channels are where they are. And then um, we were talking, weren't we, about um, Cindy Engel, weren't we, we heard yes. earlier on? Yes, um, brilliant. I think she's absolutely great. She's done lots of work with new energy work. Um, and um, and some of that, some of the stuff she's coming up, she's finding out about the latest research about the nervous systems, absolutely fascinating. And, and also not just that, but also how we can get information through somatic empathy. Suddenly I started to understand why we do certain things um, in Shiatsu to pick up information and how it works. It's just been a revelation for the last few years. Yeah. So let's have a little look through this and see what we've got. Um, okay, so this is a real basic exercise that we do when we learn Shiatsu and I'm sure everyone's probably done this, this exercise of feeling the connection between the hands. So I thought we'd just, um, I thought we'd just do that for a minute or two, just get an experience, and then we can maybe have a like a discussion about what's for an exploration of what's actually happening there. Okay, so if you'd like to just rub your hands together. Okay, now let's try this first of all. Before we do this bit, we'll just do this. Wow, my hands are important. We have to extend our arms like this. Okay, so now what we're doing is we're going to relax. We're going to feel a connection between heaven and earth. So we've got the head floating up and the sacrum relaxing downwards. Okay. And we're going to relax the arms completely, but keep them extended. And if you feel your arms getting tired, what I'd like you to do is just send your key, you know what that is, your, your intention, down through your hands, into your palms and off towards the horizon. Okay, now as you get tired, what I'd like you to do is rather than tense up the body, I would like you to relax more Breathe and send your key through your arms so your arms are being supported by that key projection. Okay, now the interesting thing is, is from a Western point of view, if you lift your arms up like this, you'd expect the circulation to be reduced in the hands, right? Like if you cut yourself, you bring your arms up, right? Yes. But actually what's probably happening, if it's anything like me, is the hands are actually getting warmer and this is another interesting mind-body connection. So we're actually directing what we would call key into the hands and increasing the circulations into the hand. Okay, and so now once we've got that, I want you to like just make a, uh, imagine a ball here between the hands, okay? Okay, now if you close your eyes and tune into what's happening in your hands, And then bring your hands further apart. And then make the ball smaller, like a tennis ball or something about tennis ball size. And then just kind of roll that around. There's a good chance you're going to feel kind of tingling feelings in the actual hands. Maybe even a feeling of pressure between the hands. Okay. 
Okay, right, so now, now just stop for a second, just hold that board in front of you, okay? And now go back into your uh, awareness of your alignment again. So you're gonna get that head floating up, okay? Bring the awareness of your connection with the earth or the, where you're sitting down into the earth. Really expand that out, okay? Just see what happens as you do that. We're going to relax, open up the armpits, relax the arms. Okay, now there's a pretty good chance that if you do that, despite the fact you've got your arms at, extended out in front of you, you're going to feel a stronger feeling between the hands. Okay, so we're going to roll it round, connecting again with our alignment and then bring our hands. And then to finish up, we can just bring the hands together, rub them together, okay? And then shake them out, okay? Hi, Karen, Elisa, you made it. You got your camera working, well done. <laughs> yeah, okay, so that's a really common exercise, right? I guess everyone can feel, you know, we're used to feeling something, aren't we there? And certainly like 40 years ago, if you mentioned that to anyone from any sort of scientific basis, they'll probably think you're some kind of crazy, you know, lunatic <laughs> yes, <laughs> imagining exactly. it or something like that. But actually, we know a lot more now about what is happening. And the interesting thing is, um, for me, is is this, you know, like, um, if you look into James, James Oxford's book, and I was lucky to um, do a Berlin energy medicine conference with him back in 2000 and something, I think it was 10, I think, um, was it? something like that I can't remember now yeah but we did a conference together and um it was really interesting to to work with him and uh there's some really good research here the biomagnetic field in the hands um that has been shown in this research here to be stronger with people who are tr trained in qigong okay they can mm -hmm. increase the um, a measurable amount of biomagnetic field. What that actually means is it's like a magnetic field that's created by the body itself. Um, a thousand times stronger. A thousand so. times stronger than the normal like baseline level. So that's a massive, you know, yeah. increase. And you, the chances are quite good that you've probably got a taste of that when I stopped you, just took you back into your alignment, into that kind of Qigong thing, opening up and everything. You feel it getting a little bit stronger. Well, imagine you spend your whole life doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is some other, um, right. So this is the exercise we just did create the energy connection in our hands. And look, this is another really, really interesting thing that I thought was so interesting because this is another example where um, it's kind of a crossover and how scientific research has been influenced by, by um, fields and things like that, because you may be aware that in hospitals, they actually have machines now that help bone healing um, by inducing a um, magnetic field around the broken bone for really serious fractures. So they found that it increases the bone healing. Now, the interesting thing is, is that when this, when um, Zimmerman measured the different frequencies in the hands, there's a whole bunch of frequencies and those frequencies match the frequencies, these four different zones match the ones that have a um, healing effect on different body systems. And if you think about it, that's actually quite a good adaptive evolutionary thing, isn't it? When you think about it, to have an ability in our hands, this is for thousands of years before we had even any, um, even before herbal medicine or anything like that, the fact that we could just literally use laying on of hands to directly affect body tissue would be a kind of evolutionary sensible thing to do. Um, so I think that was, that's a really good bit of research. Okay, of course, the biomagnetic field is not the only thing. Um, we've got this low frequency biomagnetic field going on that we discussed, but we've also got infrared radiation because when we do this, we get warm hands, okay? We've got biophotons as well. That's another massive. I had to I had to cut that out, even though I loved all that biophoton stuff because uh, I didn't have time. But we've got. I can give you some resources for that. Biophoton, really interesting thing. Um, and then of course it's sound as well from the blood circulation. So there's a lot going on there in the in the hands when we do that. Okay, and then we go on to the next thing, which is really interesting, which is the the fascia, which is basically all over the body. 
the collagen fibers, which basically go all over the body, um, are pizza electric. And what that actually means is, um, if you rem if you um, if you've ever had a pizza electric lighter, you know those lighters that you use. Have you yes. ever had one of those with gas heaters? You yes. click it, don't you? And it goes click, 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 and a little spark comes out. Exactly. And that that's because the, there's a little crystal in there that's crushed by you going click, click, click. It get it creates a charge, and then a spark comes out. So it creates electricity basically by pressure. Okay. Now the interesting thing is that that property, that pizza electric property, um, is shared not just by uh, certain crystals, but also because the collagen structure of the body, which connects the entire body up, um, is basically acts like a liquid crystal. And there's a book um, called Rainbow and the Worm by Mei Hong Ho um, that's all about that. So basically what it means is that when we press or compress the body, electrical uh, currents are created in the body. But it also works the other way around, which is um, if you... Um, see, this is all the different things. It was discovered in 1880, squeezing or pressing it, get an electric voltage when pressed. Crystal, bone, tendons, enamel, dentin, and collagen are all piezoelectric. So. Interesting. It, yeah. we're, we're, we're basically electrical, pressure electrical system, basically. Um, but also, this is a really interesting one. This is a, an exercise that James Oshman did in this workshop, actually. So that was, I'm going to share that with you right now after I've done this. Okay. The other thing is this reverse effect. So what happens is, okay, if you press the body, okay, you get a electrical current and then a ma magnetic field created, which can, which potentially can travel all through the body. But also it works the other way around. So if you imagine we've got an electromagnet, a biomagnetic field or electromagnetic field in this hand, if we pass it, just pass it over the body tissue, that field will create a feeling of pressure um, in the body tissue. It's a very, very faint thing, but it's a, an actual effect that you can actually feel. And I'd like to share that with you if, you, if you'd like to do that with me. This is ex, an ex, another, my great. second exercise. Yeah. yeah. So again, if we rub our hands together, we're going to build on the exercise that we just did. So. Okay, and then we do our qigong. This is this is looks amazing on Zoom, doesn't it? With these yeah. hands, looks great. <laughs> uh, and we're going to just uh, again go into our alignment, center ourselves, open up those palms. Okay, and this time we're going to get the key right the way into the fingertips as well. So we're imagining that key going into the fingertips. Okay, very good. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to work with this hand, the, whichever is your dominant hand, be right hand or left hand, whatever. We can take this, this hand is going to be the one we're going to kind of scan across, right? So now taking this finger, what I'd like you to do is just simply trace the large intestine meridian from about large intestine four or five. And what we're going to do is we're going to just literally, like what I'm doing is I'm just literally like going across the top of it like that. Now, if you really relax, open up your joints and everything to get that key into the scanning hand and then work, work across the, um, uh, just float it just about maybe a centimeter or half a centimeter above the large intestine channel. Or you can do it over any channel, it doesn't matter. Okay, you just work it, go over. You can feel the influence for sure. You can feel like a tingling or almost like a pressure in the body tissue. And that very subtle effect is the compression of the body tissue because of the biomagnetic field from the hands. You know? So basically, whenever we go close to each other, we press them, all kinds of interactions are happening on the physical level, you know, and which just, again, makes it, you know, it's just, I think, it's absolutely amazing. Um, so that's the piezoelectric effect and the biomagnetic field in the hands. So this is the induction one, look, warming up your hands, pass the hand over the large intestine channel. Can you feel a sensation like a tingling or slight pressure? That's for you know, induction. 
Okay, so then we move on to this recent book, which I which has totally blew my mind. Has anyone read this book, book, The Science of Meditation? Really recommend it actually because it's such an, an amazing story as well. It's from the the guys that started the mindfulness movement off, and it's so fascinating. They were you know like in the seventies, they were going up mountains in you know Tibet and finding people in caves that have been meditating the whole year and wiring them up with all these like literally taking suitcases of all these like equipment up there and wiring up these poor hermits that were sitting in these caves <laughs> and they were just finding you know they were just getting they were just getting readouts that they just were just like unbelievable like way out there like just so incredible control of the mind and the body you know through meditation and that's what kind of kicked them off with the whole mindfulness thing um and just reading that book really does, I think, um, really does emphasize the fact that what we're doing is totally right in the right zone. Because when you think about it, that's the whole thing about Shiatsu. It's not just a external material, materially based thing. You know what I mean? Like if you think of the mind body state, you think of the body external to you, you press it or you do something, you give it a tablet, you do something, whatever, to yeah, it. Yeah, it's not purely Very, mechanical, you know. Yeah, exactly. Whereas built right into the heart of Shiatsu practice, more than any other bodywork modality that I know of, is self-development, isn't it? I mean, we're essentially tuning our own mind and our body all the time, right from the first workshop. Um, and 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 that whole research onto the heteroelectric effect and the biomagnetic field from the hands. And then when I read this book, I thought, well, that's it. It just really reaffirms that we're right in there. And also the other thing I like about it is it it's so applicable. And it's and I, again, I, I used this uh, some of this research when I did the mental health first aid project. Yes. Just because it's just such good research out there. And I think that's one of the one of the reasons why we started new energy work off. We called it new energy work rather than shiatsu, blah, 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 whatever, because we wanted to try and make bridges with all the other modalities that were feeding into the the feel you know what i mean the whole body work feel yeah. um and, and once you get in once you get there because shiatsu is quite small compared to mindfulness say or yoga or whatever it's really good to tap into that because then suddenly we're obviously much stronger together than we are apart okay and so then we get on to breathing and this is like another really really interesting thing and it also made me realize one of the reasons why i got addicted to yoga when i was a child and i was dealing with the, these childhood issues that i had also another interesting thing is i took up a wind instrument as well which is which is one of the reasons why i can't do a friday as Michal knows because i'm do i always do a i play the saxophone on a friday evening <laughs> and, and um and and that was so interesting because when I found out about the whole polyvagal theory, I suddenly realized why I got addicted to yoga and took up a wind instrument because both of them are to do with controlling the breath and influencing the nervous system through the breath. Suddenly I realized that intuitively somehow I figured out my own healing program when I had no idea why. And uh, at the time I just did it because I knew it felt good and stuff. Mm. And same with shiatsu, to be honest as well. I mean, I love doing shiatsu for the same reason, I think, with, because of the whole self-development side. Um, so breathing can affect the whole nervous system. So I thought a, um, a fun thing to do would be to do a simple breathing exercise. And then what we can do is we can look at it from two modalities, two worldviews. We'll look at it from the Taoist worldview and we look at it from the neurological worldview. And then we can just kind of contrast how we feel about those two worldviews when we're actually doing it. Right? So this comes from polyvagal theory. I love this stuff. Okay, look, this, I remember I quoted uh, uh, Stephen Porges earlier um, because he was one of those ones who's really sensitive about the mind-body split. And uh, that's why a lot of alternative therapists really like his work because it cuts right across between the physical and the emotional uh, body. Um, okay, so I thought what we'd do is we're going to do a simple breathing exercise, as simple as it gets. We're going to, first of all, we're going to, and if you want to record what happens to you on a piece of paper, that's fine. Or you can just kind of like um, experience what happened. We're going to do a real simple exercise. We're going to basically emphasize the in-breath for a while, see what happens. And then we're going to emphasize the out-breath for a while. Okay. And then we're just going to see what happens to our 
whole body mind system as we do it okay so if you'd like to do it with me okay we can just close our eyes and what we're going to do is we're going to exaggerate or emphasize the in breath okay so here we go we're going to breathe in and then de-emphasize the out breath so just let the breath come out so we're doing a long strong in breath and then just let the air out. Okay, we'll do this like five times because you're breathing in. Okay, right now we're going to go back into a, like a neutral breathing pattern. We're just, just breathing gently in and out. And just reflect back to what what kind of experience we had when we emphasized the in-breath there. Okay, just really relax and let that memory just kind of settle in for a while. Okay, cool. Right, so now let's do the opposite. Let's emphasize the exhalation. So we're going to breathe in. And then maybe make a sound or just emphasize the exhalation. Make it as long as you can. So it's like... So it's breathing in and breathing out. Okay, so that's two. We'll do another three. Okay, nice and easy. Breathing in. Long exhalation, emphasizing that out breath. Yeah, okay, another two. So breathing in. Long exhalation. And then one more. Okay, very good. So now we're just going to keep the breathing nice and neutral now. And just reflect back and see how your energy felt when we emphasize the in-breath and when we emphasize the out-breath. Okay, and it's, I think you'll agree, it was a different feeling, wasn't it? It was a kind of different, a very different experience. Very different. And, yeah. yeah, so if you're anything like me, you found the first one was more energizing and kind of like more activating. And yeah. the second one was much more kind of calming and, you know, uh, kind of calming, yeah, more deregulating. Yeah, the, so, the first one I felt more in the, the upper body. Yeah. Exactly. The second one more the lower body from the waist right. down. Yeah. yeah, good. And this we can go into more about that as well. But yeah, no, exactly. So it's very, di very different, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And there's two ways we can explain that, depending on which worldview we want to be in. Um, oops. Slip from PDF there for a second. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So look, we can either think about it in terms of yin and yang. So the in breath is yang. So look, you felt it more in the upper body, which is more yang more activating you know and the out breath is more yin you know so it's more kind of calming lower down and everything and so we might give that breathing exercise to one of our clients who's breathing like this and can't calm down mightn't we and we might say oh yeah you know the reason why you want to do that is because you know the out breath is more yin and everything and they kind of go no okay and they just they just don't connect with it okay whereas if we look into polyvagal theory, the interesting thing is the outbreath activates the parasympathetic nervous system. So we can use that as a model, and that, which I've done many, many times with my clients ever since I got into all of this stuff, you know, a few years ago. Um, and they can connect with that instantly. And we use that in the mental health first aid project. You know, we have all of that neurophysiological stuff. The interesting thing is the breathing exercise is exactly the same. But it's just the way we're explaining it that makes it more um, meaningful, I guess, for different for different people. Okay, I'm very conscious we've got one more minute left, um, and this is a chart you use a lot. It's yeah, I use that a lot too. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, it's a great it chart. Perfect. I use it with my clients all the time. It's so good, and uh, and it, it's great. I like about it most of all is it takes the shame out of. Uh, the fact that people are all over the place, you know, they feel, oh, I shouldn't be like this. I should, I don't know what's wrong with me, you know, and I just, the most powerful thing I found my clients is you say, look, 
your nervous system is looking after you it's trying to look after you okay mm -hmm. and the thing is um it's doing its absolute best and this is what happens you know you go into the sympathetic nervous system because you're under stress you're going to get into that flight and fight response you're going to feel agitated it's because it wants to get you out of danger you know you're going to but we can deactivate that with the breathing and i show them the breathing and they're going to feel calmer and everything but the, the, the client but the client clientele that i feel i've helped the most with are the ones that are going to the blue zone because that's when you're going to get that shame hopeless feeling exactly. and it's i've seen people's eyes literally light up when i've shown this chart i've seen that happen you say look your nervous system's shutting down because you're under stress it's not your fault there's no shame in it okay and yes. let's work with it and in actual fact what you interesting to what i found is and i've done this many times with clients is that sometimes you have to get them into that sympathetic nervous breathing pattern first to get them out of the freeze response you don't really want to be deactivating them even more because they get stuck even more in the freeze you know because they don't really want to be calmed down anymore because they're shutting down yeah to kind of wake them up and energize them and then bring them down through the red zone you know so i guess that's another example of where you know we could explain it in terms of yin and yang but it's kind of useful to have that model um, from the uh, physiology of the nervous system. And that's just I kind of one of the themes of this presentation is just like, you know, we've got an awesome technology with Shiatsu and Taoism. It's, we were just talking about that, weren't we, Miho? Yes. Um, about what you were doing with your public workshops. You know, it's so easy for us to forget just how awesome this stuff is and how simple a lot of it is. Um, so we've got this amazing thing, and now science is figuring out how it's working. We're going, we're going, yeah, right. Okay, we're right in there. We're definitely the, the people that have that have the, the skills to help people. Absolutely. Okay, so these are the these are the things we've done. Um, we've done breathing, key projector alignment, biomagnetic field in the hands, piezoelectric effect, inducing uh, an effect in the um connective tissue meditative practice changes us really worth checking that book out breathing in the nervous system just a couple more if i can have can i have another three minutes of <laughs> course minutes. yeah uh, here's another really cool stuff that i absolutely love that, you know because you know the whole meridian thing the channel thing it's like you know oh yeah you know like there's this line down your leg that's related to your liver you go really are you you know are you kidding me you know what i mean yes. <laughs> And uh, and I mean, I'd looked at all the previous research on why the channels are where they are. And I didn't find anything as convincing as Daniel Keown, who's a bit of a maverick figure. You know, a lot of people don't like him, especially in the acupuncture world. They really don't like him. He's a maverick figure. Um, he's no saint or anything, but I, yeah. he, I, he has got some really inf interesting information. Um, and he's just mapped all the em embryological facial pains to the the organs in a completely convincing way for me i mean it just makes total sense he's got an interesting background his dad was a surgeon so he's so he was really used to working around through the facial plane so even probably as a young boy he was finding out more about them <laughs> um and he's got a really good background down because he's a medical doctor emergency doctor and an acupuncturist and the interesting thing is that the facial planes map directly between the channels and the organs and what that actually means is this is an example of a what it looks like inside a, a channel where you kind of blow up. You know, when, when they do operations, they often they put air into the facial planes and they blow up the the it with air. So they separate these spaces in the body. Interesting. So that's what the meridians are, the channels are. They're the spaces in between these uh, planes. And here's a here is here is it. This is like a cross-section of the leg, all of the muscles and everything. So the gaps where the white bits are are where the muscles connect with the facial planes and this is straight out of his book um and it's just you can just see exactly where the facial planes are and it just made so much sense to me i just thought yeah it's just like totally obvious you know and the reason it has a reason and the, the interesting thing is the previous research they've done all kinds of things like injecting dyes into the body and radioactive things and tracing them they go oh it definitely goes there <laughs> but they couldn't figure out why it went down there and it's just so simple. There isn't anything there. There isn't anything. It's a space. It's a space in the body. That's the thing. That's why they can find it. It's not a thing, the meridians. It's a space. space um, yeah. So anyway, 
that that was a real big thing for me and that's really helped me a lot so people go oh what are the meridian uh, you know channels and meridian channels? they're they're just spaces in the you know uh facial planes that connect with internal organs whatever carry on <laughs> um and you can feel them yourself as well as if you if you have that mindset and you really figure it out you can feel it really clearly so if you go back to something like this right and you go to the gallbladder channel, for example. So you just feel your gallbladder channel on my leg. I can't, you can't see my leg because it's off camera, but I'm feeling my outside of my leg. <laughs> and you feel around, you'll feel those muscles there. And you'll feel that if you press into that channel, it just separates a bit. And you can feel the muscles separating. And that's because you're going right into that channel there. Okay. Um, and we could go on for, you know, like I say, another couple of days about what goes on when you press in there. But that's another story just for the location, you know. Which brings me the last two minutes. I really have to ma mention Sydney. Yes, if you we have to some... mention her. Yeah, yeah. You, you're a fan, aren't you, Michelle? Yes, yes. She she's been uh, a guest on uh, the uh, on the show, and uh, her research is 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 dear to my heart and much needed. And now she adds a world for sure. Yeah. It's awesome. She's gr absolutely great, and she's one of our graduates. She's a local graduate from our school in Norwich. So there oh, we are. Yes, really proud yeah. of that. Yeah, and. Um, yeah, she's just absolutely incredible. And it's so useful because she's a very advanced Qigong teacher, a very advanced Jiaxi practitioner. Um, and But she's also like a real academic researcher. And she's got her finger right on, literally on the pulse of what's happening. So all this new research is coming out. And this is just some of her, this is, I actually took this from one of her presentations about uh, body brain systems, log, logging into information. Um, so basically they're starting to unpick how we actually connect with people and um a lot of it happens way outside of our co conscious awareness i mean you know it really does it's just so much information we we're aware of like this much of like exactly. uh, much of stuff information that's coming in which makes sense about how we prepare for doing shiatsu we're basically training ourselves to become sensitive to that information mm -hmm. um and this is some stuff you did with us for about the hara diagnosis um Basically, now that I understand, see, one of the things I really, really couldn't understand was why there are so many different models, like different maps of the Hara, and they all kind of seem to work. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, and it turns out that it's not the actual location of the areas, although it does have some physiological basis, is not the primary thing, especially when we're talking about key, because when we talk about key, we're talking about information, a much wider range than the physical body. So basically what happens is, the, is that a process of somatic empathy. In other words, we pick up information from the other person through lots of different subconscious channels um, that's then organized by our conceptual model. So when we train in Shiatsu and we train, this is the heart meridian, this is the gallbladder, this is the stomach. What we're doing is essentially is we're training ourselves to filter out somatic empathy information. Um, and so that kind of answered so many questions that I that really were bothering me for quite a long time and that's it i just oh. overran slightly there sorry about that but that's um, okay you've got like five seven minutes for that, that, elaine that was... i can't believe you're here it's lovely to see elaine <laughs> that was great uh thank you so much uh for breaking it down like that for us uh mm -hmm. and that brings me to a question and and, and then uh, i'll open the floor for others too uh, I mean, forty-two years you mentioned, right? Of doing shiatsu. Yeah, like nineteen eighty-one. I can't. I can't keep the years go past so fast now. Elaine will probably agree with that. <laughs> yes. The years five so fast. We, we talked about the the boom of the eighties, right? Late seventies and eighties for shiatsu, and now you you called it the golden age, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, you know we are now where we are, twenty twenty-three. And, uh, you know, part of creating uh, this podcast, uh, a big reason for me personally was to to bring the global shiatsu community together and and, 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 and do more collabor collaborative work and really bring shiatsu out to to the public, to the world. Yeah, you know, great. in a way, have a, a, a renaissance, let's say, or maybe another golden age or or, or moving into this next paradigm together. You know, Absolutely, and, yeah. and you totally be, being being in that golden era of shiatsu and and going over the last forty years and continuing to research and and grow and develop and innovate yourself. Uh, what 
what's your take? What what have you what do you see moving forward? I think that th we're definitely moving into a different a different time. There's all kinds of different um, stresses on people, you know. Um, my feeling is that shiatsu, especially if you combine it with, like I say, all the other modalities that are in our area, you know, like yoga and mindfulness and everything like that. I think it's a really essential, it's an essential thing it, for healing it, healing on all different levels, you know? I mean, you've got the, you've got our own per personal understanding of ourselves, which I think is a really important thing and which there's a real need for that, like you experienced when you did that public workshop. You know, these, just these very simple techniques can be, can be life-changing, like you said, for people. So that's one of the things we're trying to do. And we, in fact, we had a meeting this morning about exactly that, trying to get the grassroots side of Shiatsu out there because there's such a huge need for it. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, so there's that. And then, of course, there's also the healing on the planetary level. You know, with the, we just did an uh, online uh, seminar on the climate change and Shiatsu and stuff like that. That's going to be a massive thing over the next few decades. Can you imagine the amount of stress that we're going to be under planetary wise? You know what I mean? And I think, and for me, that's like a two-sided thing as well, because in a way, what we need is we need for people to connect deeply with a connection with yin and yang, with the earth. You know what I mean? Because that, that I mean, I, again, I could go, I did a, a, a seminar on this in Kiental before the pandemic about how that reductionist me mechanistic view that we were talking about earlier also feeds in culturally to capitalism, you know, to the whole consumer society, to the whole materialism again that dominates things. And there's definitely a pushback against that now. So I think Shiatsu's got Shiatsu has got such a powerful role to play on all those different levels. Um, and and I just think there's such a massive need for it that it's inevitable that we're going to be in demand. It's just that's why I'm so excited about the stuff that I presented in this uh, presentation because. For me, it's making it accessible for people. You know what I mean? So it's not kind of, kind of some weird thing uh, that it's like, yeah, you know, like these are the channels, it's embryological, you know, this is the nervous system, you do this, you breathe, you press. It's all so simple and so powerful. And if we've got the language that we can make it accessible to other, to people easily, then we've got it on our side and we can take, we can, we can, rise to the role that I really believe, you know, is so important for everyone, planet and individual so That's my take on it. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful, yeah. I totally agree. Uh, innovation and shiatsu, I mean, I've had some guests here, uh, you know, there's, um, you know, the a lot of guests uh, or speakers that I've had uh, maybe don't like the fact, or maybe not liking, but are uncomfortable with how shiatsu is taken uh, and how it's expressed and how it's showcased as they're afraid that we are moving away from the roots of what shiatsu is and the principles. What do you say to that? I think so. It's always evolved. It's always evolved, well, especially in the, the threat, the, the, the lineage that I'm in, basically, which is basically Masanaga, Pauline Sasaki, you know, and then I was... I was apprenticed by Pauline. So that Masnaga was, he was always innovating. He was bringing in Western psychology. You know, you look at all his notes from the 70s. He was he was constantly trying to make it relevant to the modern world and, you know, and all that. And I, I just think, you know, as long as the core practice is there, it doesn't matter. I don't think that, that matters really. You know, I mean, I think we should just be flexible and move, move with the times. The most important thing is to get out there and help people not kind of close ourselves off and just become like a cliquey thing. And, um, you know, I just don't think that's relevant, really. It's just this, you know, there's no time for that. Good. We need got to get out there and help people. You know? Agree. Well, this is a good time to open the floor for the guests that are here. Uh, people, if you want to add to the conversation or ask a question, just let me know. Any feedback or questions? Uh, Karen, go ahead. Yeah, Cliff, um, I'm going to be in a meeting later this afternoon. We're putting together our fall retreat, and the topic we've chosen is creating community and connection. And the idea is, is getting shiatsu out there 
so that people yeah. can access it. Um, you have any suggestions for us? Yeah, well, funnily enough, we we're just having a meeting with our team this morning about exactly that. And what we were thinking of doing actually was rather was a bit like we've done with the mental health first aid project was actually de-emphasizing the shiatsu side of it and actually doing workshops on specific things, you know, like long COVID and things like that. Issues that aren't powerfully treated by shiatsu, but are really difficult to treat with Western medicine. And there's a big need for them. So that's actually what we're planning to do. We're planning to put another layer underneath the professional training, um, which is going to not even the shiatsu branding kind of thing. It's going to be more in the background and it's going to be more like wellness, you know, help yourself with, you know, help yourself with your whatever it is. Uh, so Thanks. I think that's the way the way we're going to try and do it. So we have to keep in touch with that and see how you get on. Yeah, I, I, I would I'd love to do that. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we definitely share some of our material, you know, the publicity material. Be, that'll be interesting. Thanks. Um, so I'll let you know what we're doing too. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah I get your emails. Yeah. Okay. okay that, that's the key. Yeah, to get out there again, get out of our little comfort zones and go out there to the public. They need us more than ever. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Anybody else? Uh, Peter or Barbara? And Yen, go ahead, Peter. Just unmute yourself. I don't have a question. I just want to thank Cliff. I was uh, uh, going to his teachings for many years. Now it's just a long time ago, but uh, you're such a wonderful teacher and you can bring things so clearly. Uh, uh, I really appreciate it uh, today also. And in my opinion, it's really important to understand this uh, concept of uh, Stephen Porches because our society now is going into this uh, stress models, fight and flight everywhere, you know, and uh, the next uh, level will be the freeze models. And this will be in a few years, probably, when <laughs> not even earlier. I tell, so, you, uh, I tell you what, when we did that, we did our public, that's another way of getting out. We've done the you may be aware of our Wednesday class that we did a free Wednesday class. We've done three years now and we've been trying to people. And when we did the polls at the beginning, we were having like significant numbers of people who self-assessed that they were in the blue zone. This was during the shut during the lockdown, you know? Yes, yes. Um, but I was relieved to see on our third birthday, which was last Wednesday, I did the poll again and no one was in the blue zone. I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sticking with us for three years, you know. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah, but you're absolutely right. No, I think that's a really important point. Yeah, it's great to see a few people that I haven't seen for so long. It's been really fun to see, you know, to see some people I haven't seen for ages. Great. Yes. Anybody else? Uh, maybe uh, Viorel or uh, Aniel? Yeah, go ahead, Viorel. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, just a, a small observation, historical. Uh, yeah. Qi is actually uh, it's, it's, uh, Qi predates Taoism right okay yeah the doctrine of Qi is not purely uh, a Taoist concept or doctrine yeah absolutely yeah. Um, secondly I was trying to understand uh, the overall uh, the, the point that you're trying to make mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if uh, if there is enough awareness of the situation from the encounter between the Western medicine and the traditional medicine. Uh -huh. Because uh, this encounter uh, is, uh, is in a later stage now. And yeah. all the attempts that you, you tried to, to speak, to, to frame the traditional medicine with Western modern biomedical concepts. Yes. Has been already tried. It, it, there are people who still try yeah, sure. to frame the finger pressure, the traditional medicine with the medical the modern framework. Yeah. Uh, but there are people that they are, the current state uh, seems to be. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, I, I have also the call, and uh, yeah, no, I'm yeah. trying to put my ideas together. Um, I don't want to, to, to keep the, the floor too long. So, 
The point is that some people consider that there is no point in trying to frame traditional medicine with modern uh, medical technology. Yes. Because each medical system is grounded in two different radical different worldviews that are That's irreconcilable. That's right. Exactly. So some people call it this a double betrayal yeah. because you're trying to frame a medical system that has never employed medical technology to to explain yeah. itself. That's right. Yeah. And just like also, you, you it's very it's impossible to validate traditional medicine with modern terminology. Uh, the medical establishment, the I'm sorry. Yes. Actually, it has been no no question. Actually, it's time to preach. I'm sorry. Um, maybe with, with with a different context, we will have the time to to discuss historical yeah. encounter between the modern medicine and the yeah. Medicine. I, I apologize. No yeah, part of that part of that is what is is part of that is a structural thing about the nature of knowledge and also about scientific revolutions. You know, like I'm sure you're aware of the whole idea of a paradigm, Kuhn's paradigms, and incommensurability is a big thing in philosophy of science. So, in other words it's actually impossible to measure one paradigm against the other because you're in a completely different worldview. You know what I mean? And But the thing, the point I was kind of making in a way was in order to reach a bigger audience and, and to reach as many people as possible, what we have to kind of do is train ourselves so that we can leap from one paradigm into the other. I'm not saying, you know, and so I think that's just a, a skill that we can we can do. And I, I don't think it is, tr there, are, there are certain things that are very difficult to, um, assess scientifically but people are trying and if you look at the scientific re research group they're doing a lot of work along those lines there's different ways of approaching it you can approach it from the efficacy way like so if it, it's effective at doing this but there's also another level which is like how could that ever possibly you know happen that you can do this and get this information you know what i mean and I, I, from what I've, the experience I've had with working with people who are interested in doing that is that actually, yes, I can do that now. I can say, yeah, actually, you know, it is not kind of some kind of wacky, mad thing that you can place your hand on a certain area on the abdomen and get information about someone's emotional state. Whereas from a, from a, um, a reductionist mechanistic view, it's like insanity. It's like partly because they, partly because they can't really integrate consciousness in itself into the model anyway. And certainly they can't find any way that placing your hand on a particular area is going to give you information. But that's just not the case now. You know, that there is a lot of very interesting research that gives us a good idea of that that is happening. Actually, things like that actually happen all the time. Um, and I suppose that's the, the interesting thing for me is that actually traditional medical systems um, are actually closer to life, actually. <laughs> Yes. the actual life that we live in because the me reductionist me mechanistic view is just not how we live we don't live like that we don't see each other as machines you know we know we're aware of consciousness in other people and stuff like that so it's a very interesting debate and i'm aware of all of the different issues and stuff like that i just i suppose I just share what i've my experience has been and uh what i think is the most constructive way for us to move forward to bring the best you know that we can to everyone sort of thing beautiful karen you had something to say to that yeah i just wanted to say where i find this most effective is when i'm working with my clients yes i mean part of of what i consider the therapeutic relationship is to get them involved in what we're doing together and if sure. i can explain it to them in language that they understand as yeah. you were saying, that 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 makes the whole session more therapeutic, even if you know on a philosophical level there's a clash. To to, yeah. to be able to translate it is important into people's language. I think so too. Yeah, let's be able to trans transverse that into the different paradigms. You know, because especially as I said before, you know that that model is the dominant paradigm in the in the world now. Actually. So, you know, it's, it's a case of being able to communicate exactly like you said. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. I find, uh, as Karen said, uh, a long time ago, I stopped talking about Shiatsu because uh, it was a little self-centered. 
because all I, I realized that what, what the people that were coming to see us, what they wanted to know is 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 if we can help them, whatever they've been yeah. struggling, you know, and, and that was the most important thing. And uh, the best way to my experience in this locality, in this in my whole career in locality, is the best way to, to spread things is just work on your own, work on your own development and just do the best work you can and just do the best you can and then it just spreads out like a like a wave and that's what's mm -hmm. happened in this community you know i mean the awareness of shiatsu in this area is very high and it's just because we've just had so many students and we've got so many practitioners out there working at a high level getting really good results and and you and if you do that people will come to you you know that's the best way to do it, I think. Good advice. The, I, I want to highlight the new energy. It's like water, you know. It keeps yeah. the low <laughs> power, the loneliness. Yeah, sorry. Can you put up the uh, your website, the New Energy Network? for, for the, uh, Yeah, the, New uh, Energy Network. Yeah, if you're not aware of it, I don't know. Um, let me just say, yeah. I mean, this is this is my thing. This is my kind of thing, which I've been working on for quite a while. This is the, Look, this is Karen Lisa. This is the... We're working with the AOBTA to do this. This is actually tomorrow, so you can... Yeah, Winter Jade, she was, was a guest, too. Great, great yeah. woman. And then we've got Michael Diagro, Marla uh, Kuali, and our old friend, Margaret Rossi. And look, and there's loads of stuff. Look, there's a um, YouTube video from... Um, I saw that YouTube episode. Yeah. Right there, if you want to have a really exciting hour, you, you, you know, you click on there. And then we've got all kinds of stuff here. This is the this is the um, climate change thing we did recently. Um, this is Glock Kiental. We're doing a rip, a partnership with them this year, uh, and loads of other stuff as well. And there's loads of free stuff. You can join as a free member. We've got a really good teaching team. All these different people, some of which you may know and you may not. Um, so you can just join as a free member. And we're funded by subscription. So if you want to actually join as a subscriber, or you can um, you just look, you know. Have fun with the free stuff it's up to you but we've got enough luckily now we've got enough subscribers to keep the lights on just about so we're <laughs> we're viable um so amazing yeah, job and you started this uh how long ago chris uh, um well i started doing i started doing um online um i decided i was a very early adopter i started off in 2000 2000 developing it so it's 23 years ago and that's before Facebook, before YouTube, before everything. And uh, in fact, we don't really do much on Facebook. We, we've got our own mailing list. We had 800 people signed onto our platform at the beginning of the coronavirus. And then we put out, you know, several years of free stuff, worked off donations. And now we've got over 3,000 people signed on to the yeah. learning environment. So it's a pretty big community. And we've got just a few of those actually pay us money, but just enough to keep all the platforms running and to keep us, you know, which is great. It is actually the, the pandemic, all the work we did in the pandemic actually put us into a viable space now. So it's been very positive for us in that, a way that we've spread that word, you know, and it's, you know, really great fun. Your courses we, during the pandemic were, were very helpful, uh, I'm sure for many, many therapists and, and including myself, uh, the, the online distance workshop or seminar that you did. Mm -hmm. Uh, just made me realize personally that hey, wait a second, I can do, I can do this with all my clients. There you go. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I never stopped working through the pandemic because of that. You just seeing right. you doing it and taking us through it just kind of right. gave me that permission to do it. it. Was so helpful and obviously helpful to all my clients who, who was stressing. Oh, well, that's great to hear. Yeah, but well, we were in a very fortunate position because we'd been doing it for so long. That we had all the equipment we had we had all the knowledge the tech we had the cameras the lights everything the platforms and everything so within a week we were just out there just you know like i think we did i don't even know how many we did we did so many webinars in six different languages and we just and we we, we lived totally off donations as well we just put all that out there and and we just worked like a cooperative so we just literally like got the donation money in we all logged how many hours we'd done that month and we just said we just paid ourselves up we just divided the money up like that and we survived like that through the first year or two amazing now of course donations are going down so now we just rely on our subscribers who pay a small amount each month to keep us going and keep all the platforms going and everything so yeah so it was an unbelievable experience i mean obviously it was a very stressful and very difficult time but also it was so inspiring to see how much good came out of it and how much positivity came out of it 
you know, like we've got the community now that's funding the angels that are funding treatments for people who can't afford it. We've got the mental health thing. We've got all kinds of things that have come out of it. We've got the Wednesday class. It's still giving people, you know, three years of Wednesday classes, 150 whatever classes. And it's just been incredible. But, but it just showed you that yeah. good things can come out of stressful situations, you know. Very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff for all you do and your team uh, new energy thank you everyone here all my guests here and everybody on everything shiatsu you're so inspiring and i hope many get inspired and uh, contribute to the online programs that you do there and the seminars and your team uh, and support you guys too with money yeah that's that's optional you just hang out with us it's fine <laughs> Well, thank yeah. you so much, Clifford. You're most welcome. Thank you for inviting me. It's just great to be on someone else's show for once. I can imagine, yes. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Well, thank Love you very much. So many people I know as well. Thank you very much. And people I thank don't know. Thank you so much.